in the reality that we live in with the reform maps and um, and all that, do you think it would have been a step in a better direction if, um, in, in, if like in the Byzantine liturgy, the readings, if this is being read, Adoratum, but from the nave, um, would that have, is that more consistent with with uh, with a practice, or would that still have its own kind of alien uh, imposition into the Roman liturgy? No, I, so in the, in the, as the Father is pointing out, in the Byzantine divine liturgy, the lector stands in the back, or sometimes the middle of the church in the aisle, and, and chants the epistle facing east. But because of his location, it's easier to hear the words. Um, I don't know. I think what I tend to think about, about different liturgical traditions is that they, they, they each seem to have their own coherence. I've, I've spent many years worshiping the Byzantine rite as well as in the Roman rite. Um, and I find that it all works very well. But typically when the West tried to imitate the East, various disasters happened. Um, I mean, just to, just to take one example, you know, the, the Western uh, Eucharistic prayer, the Roman canon, never had an epithesis. The scholars who said, oh, it did, but it got lost, they were wrong. Um, and they've been proved wrong. It's, the, the theology of consecration in the Roman Canon is different from the Eastern one, and it's such an ancient prayer that it predates the controversy over the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So there's no epithesis in the Roman rite. It doesn't need to have one. It has a different understanding of what's happening there. And yet the liturgical reformers said, oh, in the East, the epithesis, you know, and they just sort of shoved it in, and, you know, into the, the Roman rite, uh, wherever they, you know, whatever they could. Um, and that just ends up making a sort of long roll, you know, uh, so, but I, I do think that um, it's, it's ideal if the epistle and the gospel being chanted can be chanted in such a way that the people could follow along with the words, either because they know some Latin, we've studied it, we should always study some Latin. Uh, sorry, I just think that's necessary for Catholics. Um, you know, the, Israel, the, the, the Jews do it with Hebrew, right? What's our problem? Um, but, but, but even if you don't understand all the words, even to have it in your missal, you know, Latin on one side, English on the other, the, the mass repeats itself so often that you get used to it. You sort of absorb the sense of, of these sacred words. You know, you hear the word margarita, and you think about, oh, okay, so it's the gospel about the pearl, you know, <laughs> these things happen. Um, so I, I think it's good for it to be heard, and, uh, you know, but even if, even if you can't pick up all of the words, um, that's not necessarily an impediment to participation. And I also don't think it's a problem for the priest to read the epistle and the gospel in the vernacular before his homily. I don't see why that would be a problem. It's not really a liturgical act at that point, but it's just a way of, of helping with the instructional aspect of the reading. Thank you very much. Any other okay, we have some questions in the back. Thank you, Dr. K. Um, my question is, when did church plants and the route start to appear in church architectures? Um, Obviously, they don't have like a clear axis. Yes. Actually, it's, it's quite interesting. You know, you might think that churches in the round that have pews on all sides and an altar in the middle, you might think that that's just a very recent um, aberration, you know, something from the past 60 years or whatever. Uh, that's actually not true. There were some ancient churches that were built on a round plan, but they weren't parish churches. They weren't religious churches. They were usually mausoleums, or they had some special purpose, like a chapel and shrine. Uh, maybe the relics were kept there in the middle. So there were, when you had a circular type of building, it wasn't meant as a normal church layout. It was meant for some special reason. Uh, and therefore, those, those churches never tended to be really active spots where you know, lots of, of regular liturgy was happening. You might have like a pilgrimage event there, or a mass for the dead or something, uh, or a wedding perhaps uh, in some cases. So, so yeah, so, but, but the modern craze for the church in the round, you know, there is a modern craze that starts in the, in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and that seems to be based on this false idea, very popular among the liturgical reformers, that the mass is a reenactment of the Last Supper. 
That's a Protestant notion, that's not a Catholic notion. The Council of Trent teaches that our Lord on Holy Thursday instituted the sacrifice of the Mass, which makes present the sacrifice he offered the day after on Good Friday on the cross. That's what the Mass is. It's a, it's a re-presentation of the sacrifice of Christ, Christ on Calvary. So it's a sacrifice that is also a banquet. We can partake of the sacrificial victim. It's not primarily a meal. So the, the Church of the Round, I think, I think, is connected with this idea of bringing the altar out, having the priest face the people, and treating it as this kind of social gathering for a meal. Which, ironically, it's, it's ironic too, because even if it were reenacted at the Last Supper, the Last Supper didn't take place in that manner. Uh, the, the, the way that the Jews and the Romans, too, ate their, their banquets, the Christ and the Apostles would have been reclining all on one side of a semicircular table and have been served on the other side by servers. So in, in a certain sense, uh, you'd have to, all of us would have to be gathered around a table on one side. It would be completely impossible. Right? If we really wanted to sort of reenact that. Dr. Kane, do you think at solemn mass, uh, the pre-55 rubrics uh, in which the priest silently silent reads the epistle and gospel before the deacon and subdeacon sing them, uh, or the 62 rubrics in which the priest listens uh, and does not read them silently um, is more appropriate. Yes, I, I actually um, I agree with everything in the pre-55 practice, uh, and I've looked at every difference, and um, I, I can't see any improvement that was made in the 1962. But, uh, so, so specifically to your question, or that aspect, um, the, it, is, it, it, it does seem to be the case, in terms of liturgical history, that at the beginning, in the earliest centuries for which we have records, there was a division of labor where you had um, a certain book that had the Eucharistic prayer, you had another book, the lectionary, you had another book, the gradual for the, for the choir, the scola. Um, and the people who were using those books were the only ones who did the things that were in those books. Okay, so that does seem to be true. Um, over many centuries, because of the development of low mass, in addition to high mass and solid mass, um, the priest became accustomed to saying everything in the mass. And it was even argued to be fitting that the priest, who stands in Persona Christi, was, was going to read everything in the Missal. Um, as being the one who, in a sense, concentrates the act of worship in himself and in his office as the mediator, as the, the stand-in for the mediator. Um, and, and therefore, those low mass practices migrated into, into high mass and, uh, high, and solemn high mass. Um, and so you, you can either, if you're, if you're a modern liturgist, you would say that was a corruption, that the low mass practices came and went into the solemn mass. I think, I think you can argue that it's a development, uh, a, a legitimate organic development, uh, because it keeps the celebration of the Mass for the priest more continuous. Uh, he's able to, from day to day, his offering the, of the Mass is virtually the same. Uh, and that's good for him as a celebrant, but it also has that symbolic theological function that I mentioned, the concentration of, of the liturgical texts in the priest, but also then amplified and echoed by other ministers. You know, uh, just because the priest is saying the introit doesn't mean the scola singing it is not legitimately singing it. They're making a, a, a legitimate, it's a polyphonic reality. So maybe the, the last thought I'll, I'll leave with you on that is one of the most beautiful things about the ancient liturgy, the ancient medieval liturgy really, uh, is that it is so multi-dimensional and multi-layered. Many ministers are doing many different things some of them are overlapping, some of them are duplicating. That's okay. That's the way the universe works. That's how human nature works, too. We're not like one track, linear, rationalistic, you know, function driven, agenda driven beings, or at least when we are, when we find that tedious. I mean, it's, that's, that's something that we complain about, perhaps. Uh, so I think the, the ancient liturgy and its complexity and its polyphony is, is just something glorious and beautiful, and it has benefits for in all kinds of ways. But that would be a separate talk, really, to go into. Hi, Doc. Big fan, by the way. Um, so my question is, when the Epistle and the Gospel are chanted, 
One of the things I've noticed, because I've been going to the Latin Mass for about five years now, is that when the Epistle is chanted, it's a little bit more somber, for lack of a better term, a little bit more, I guess, like, low-key, like more grounded, whereas the Gospel is a little bit more uplifting, it's a little bit more glory. Is there a difference at all in tone or anything between the Epistle and the Gospel when they are chanted? Is there any difference at all? Well, you know, it's, it's a little bit tricky to talk about the emotional um, associations of different chant melodies and modes because I think that modern people might perhaps attach certain emotional associations to certain modes or melodies that, that wouldn't necessarily have been there for people 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 years ago. Um, that means, so for example, the epistle tone, this melody might to some people sound, you know, uh, a little sad or something, but to, uh, to me it sounds, um, it sounds tender almost. Uh, I, I find the epistle tone, so, but, but again, I think it's not important really, the emotional reaction, as long as it's not a negative one. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it might strike us in different ways. The gospel tones are certainly, um, they, are, they are proclamatory tones. They're very robust. Um, there's there's one tone that, that's just basically da -da 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 -da. you know it's it's just two almost two notes and then when there's a question da -da 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 -da. so it's, it's very simple or and there are there are other gospel tones but they, they have this kind of muscularity to them um, and I think it goes along with the epistle tone matches the odd intra the aspect that I was talking about that is that the epistle is in a sense um, uh, a message of the faithful and for the faithful, at least symbolically, and that the gospel is the proclamation towards the north, towards the, the unconverted world. Um, the tones, to me, actually match those functions as I described them. Dr. Krasinski, thank you very much for providing that <laughs> compass, that sublime compass orientation that you described in the talk of uh, east, north, west, and south. My question is, um, first of all, as you know, we both know, that uh, orientation as taken with geographical literalism has not been strictly enforced since long before Vatican II, several hundred, probably several hundred years, I, I believe. Um, I, I come from, I, I live in the Dayton, Ohio area, and in that city, there's probably about eight or 10 churches, you know, traditionally built churches, like this one, uh, that were built well before Vatican II, uh, the oldest of which being uh, constructed in 1875. Uh, all but one or two of those parishes uh, are actually ironically built so that the high altar is facing north geographically, including my own parish church, uh, which is staffed by the FSS Keaton, and it's about 100 years old, the building is. But there's the vast preponderance, ironically, are built to the north. I've, I've read a few arguments you know, over the past couple years that, uh, that I find compelling, you know, to call for a return to an emphasis of building churches to the literal east. Yes. Um, I'm curious to know, you know your thoughts yes. on you know, how you would evaluate a stronger emphasis on geographical beast. Well, so, so for yeah. one, yes, you're absolutely right. There's been, the, the, the tendency in church history on a number of issues has been towards relaxation. Um, like, for example, fasting and abstinence, just to mention that. If you look at a chart of the customs that were practiced in the, at the end of the first millennium, and then in the 13th century, and then in the 16th century, and then in the 19th century, and now today, it's just a decline. This is an absolute decline in terms of what we're expected to do during Lent and, and, uh, and other times of the year. Um, and that's a bad thing. I mean, so, so some, some relaxation in certain situations might be prudent, but just a total general relaxation always downwards seems, that seems just like a warning sign. Like, when the Son of Man comes back to the earth, we find faith. You know, I mean, it, it's that kind of problem. So similarly, although I think not as grave as the fasting issue, is the issue of the early Christians taking Eastern orientation very seriously, right? I mean, to the point where 
like, I'm sure that if they were going to worship somewhere, they just immediately asked, where's the east? And that's the direction that they worshipped in. Um, and we have a lot of evidence of that, too, from, from early centuries. There's a book written by a, a German priest, uh, Monsignor Stefan Hyde, a great patrologist, one of the best. He's in charge. He's the head president of the Pontifical Academy of Archaeology. He wrote this book, which has yet to be translated in there, yet to be published in English, which definitively proves that the early Christians were eastward occupied, uh, or preoccupied in, in that sense. So yeah, I, I think I think that we should, you so know, what happens is over the centuries, um, the I think that the orientation, I mentioned this briefly in my talk, but the orientation of the church building, the church building becomes so resplendent and so decorated. And there's such a huge emphasis on the sanctuary, the apse, and the, the, the mosaics or the paintings, the statuary, the high altar, you know, these Gothic marble altars. There's such a dominant um, sort of symbolic orientation towards the crucifix, tabernacle, and high altar that that's what dominates people's imaginations. So in a sense, we, we really think in terms of like versus oxidem or versus crucem or versus altara. You know, we, that's how we think that, and that's a good instinct. It would just be good to reconnect it with its origin in the east and the cosmological sign of the sun rising in the east. So if we could reconnect those things, that would be very important. It would also help modern people, Ratzinger says, I actually, this is more and more true all the time. Modern people are so preoccupied with the works of their own hands, and now with smartphones and whatever and, you know, they're doing, uh, that they, they're not even aware of the cosmos anymore. You know, if you if you live in a, a big city, sorry, I'm not trying to attack Detroit by any means, but, but if, if you live in a, in a city with a lot of light pollution, you hardly even see the stars anymore. Um, you know, but when you go out into the wilderness and you see all these constellations, I mean, this is how ancient peoples they, they occupy themselves with telling stories about the constellations, you know, and there's a sense of wonder there, uh, a wonder about the created world, the immensity and grandeur and awesomeness of the created world. And we need to recover that. Modern people really need to recover that. Um, so I, I actually think, just to say one last thing about this, that, you know, I, I've known about um, students who have gone on backpacking trips with a chaplain where they have set up an altar outside, you know, much as Jacob did, building an altar of stones. Uh, and the Mass has been celebrated in the morning towards the east with the sun rising, you know, so you can see that and, and have that visceral experience. Um, I think that it would, that would be great for every young person to go on a backpacking trip where they can celebrate Mass at the break of dawn on Oriente, right? And really kind of burn that into the mind, like, yes, this is the connection, this is why we do that. I'm happy to announce that Anthony Allen is going to plan a uh, young adult uh, trip out to the woods, upcoming at or in the mass. It's going to be great. Bring your own stuff. <laughs> okay, so um, I appreciate all of the research. I feel like I could spend my entire life learning all of the um, meaning behind what happens in, in a Latin mass, right? There's everything has meaning, it's beautiful. Um, as we, you know, we, we face some of the challenges in the church today, does any of that, does any of that meaning pertain in the Novus Ordo? Even if, you, let's say you have a rapper in Novus Ordo, are there things that still hold meaning, like even some of it? That, because you're, what you've said today is, it's almost like it's opposite what it should be, right? So, um, is there anything? <coughs> Yes, there, so basically I would just say the simplest answer would be in as much as the Novus Ordo retained the elements of the Roman tradition, then it retains all of the symbolism that goes along with them. Uh, and we all know that, for example, the Novus Ordo can be celebrated ad orientem. Um, a lot of priests want to do it that way. They, they, they're dying to do it that way because they understand, they've read Rotzinger, they've read the theologians, they understand all the sorts of things that I, that I was talking about when I quoted St. Basil, said that worshiping East was an apostolic custom. Uh, they understand these things. The problem is twofold. One is that the Novus Ordo is so full of options that ad orientum is not required. And that brings up the second problem, which is that in the politicized environment we're living in, ad orientum is taken by bishops, especially not as a symbol of 
doing something ancient and beautiful and symbolic of Christ, but as, you know, reactionary and anti-Vatican II, and, you know, so they, they attach to it a political meaning, and then they try to condemn it for that reason, which is, which is totally absurd. We talk about politicizing the liturgy. I mean, they're, they're the, the progressive and modernist um, uh, hierarchy of members are the ones who are politicizing the liturgy because they're not, they refuse to look at the history and theology of the liturgy and make decisions based on, on, on those grounds. Um, so there are, but anyway, there, there are many, so for example, the Novus Ordo, of course, can be, can be adorned with Gregorian chant. You can chant the introit, you can chant the gradual instead of the responsorial psalm, I mean, almost nobody does that, or even knows that that's possible. In my experience, I, I directed music for many, many years for both, uh, for both forms, uh, the old and the new, and I found that I was able to pray better and, 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 and enter into the spirit of the liturgy better at the Novus Ordo to the degree that we were chanting the Mass. Right? Because chant is inherently a contemplative and meditative form of, of music, and it, it, it calms <coughs> the soul, it, it stills you, it, it, it makes you, it gives you sort of interior silence that is open to God. Um, and so, you know what I mean? So there, there are these sorts of things that can always be done in the Novus Ordo, but there are also these cultural and political pressures against incorporating those things. Uh, and, and I think it may be the case that as time goes on and the most fervent proponents of the spirit of Vatican II go on to the, the next life, uh, I, I, think, I, I think we may see some of that hostility dissipate. At least that's my, my hope and my prayer. The, uh, our community takes really seriously to it. Pope Benedict called mutual enrichment, and uh, so we're, we're not exclusively dedicating ourselves to the Latin Mass, but um, but we do the Novus Ordo uh, during the weekdays. We only, I only say one Mass, it's versus popular. The rest of the week is out Oriental, and, we're, and we include um, to, a lot of these elements that, um, that that Dr. K is talking about, including just chanting. I, I mean, a lot of those schools don't even chant the office anymore. They just will recite it, so we chant the office and things like that, we chant like the mass. And, um, but one neat little thing in, uh, was at the Triduum last year for the Easter Vigil in particular, we did all the, the readings ad orientum, uh, just trying to reincorporate the, the, what, what, what Benedict called for, which was what Benedict called for this mutual enrichment. So I know it's not exactly the direction you go in uh, with. Um, Towards reform of the reform, and I've wondered myself if that's almost the best way, but that's where our community is right now, and very much as well as having Benedict. And getting back to your point of trying to have an on ramp back onto the sacred, uh, that's what our community is trying to provide. Um, we have time for two more questions. Is that okay, Doctor? Sure. Okay. Hello, thank you for the talk. It was really nice. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I'm just wondering um, where can someone go who's looking to, you know, kind of dig deep? some of this uh, symbolism and hidden meaning, not just with the liturgy, but, you know, even with other things like the various images you'll see on a wall of church just a thousand times and not know what it means, or, like, especially the tongues used in the, in the liturgy. Sure. Um, well, there, there, are, there are quite a number of resources, but, but I can recommend one book above all for anyone who is really serious about understanding how, how the Trump team Mass developed over time, and what is the meaning of all of its parts? And uh, it, it's a book. It's a recent, fairly recent book by the author's name is Michael Fiedrowitz, F I E D R O W I C Z, um, an easy name like mine. Uh, and uh, it's it's called the Traditional Mass: The History, Form, and Theology of the of the Classical Roman Rite, um, published by Angelical Press. It's it's just a masterpiece. Um, the author himself is a priest who celebrates the Old Mass, and he's also a professor and an expert of patrology. Um, so he brings a lot of expertise to this subject, and it's just a magnificent book. I learned so much from it. Um, but then, then uh, I have a book called Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright that also talks about a lot of these sorts of things, and it's, I've got it here. If you're interested afterwards, you can come and, and meet me and have a look at it. Um, and in that book, at the end, I have a select bibliography uh, that's annotated. In other words, I recommend books and I say why. 
uh, and, and it's, it's also not overwhelming. You know, some bibliographies just go on from page to pages. This one is just a selection of all the best things. So that would be a great, a great resource for you as well. As far as, by the way, as far as artistic symbolism is concerned, that's kind of a different, if you want to know, like, why is, why is the anchor used to represent hope? And, um, you know, what's going on with shells? You know, why do you see shells all over the place? You know, it, it, those sorts of things, there are different books that, by art historians that go through all the different artistic symbols. So I think you'd have to also look, you know, in a different direction for that. Okay, my last question. Thank you once again, Doctor, for coming and giving us <coughs> here. Um, my question is, especially with the past couple months, as far as what we've seen from the Vatican, what is the future of the Latin Mass, and do you think it'll ever become mainstream again? Oh, that's a good, good uh, question. Well, you know, I, I, um, I like to say that uh, my crystal ball exploded when Pope Francis was elected uh, <laughs> to the Vessel 13, so I, I don't know how, how good my predictions will be about the future, but this, this I'm confident of, of one thing. Uh, I'm completely convinced of one thing, which is that the traditional Latin liturgy, not just the Mass, but the, di the Divine Office, all the sacramental rites, all the blessings, uh, the exorcisms, those things will not perish. They will not perish from the face of the earth. They will always be practiced. Um, that was that even happened in the 1970s, which was a much more desperate situation than now, because there were fewer that, because ultramontanism, that is the view that the Pope can never do wrong and that you should always obey whatever he says, regardless of what it is. That view was stronger when the Novus Ordo was introduced than it is now. It's been kind of wrecked by papal, by erratic papal behavior, let's put it that way. Um, and so now, you know, when, when a bishop or a pope says, you know, jump, not everybody says, okay, how high? You know, that, that doesn't happen anymore. And I think that's healthy, actually. It's, it's a healthy reaction against an extreme hyper-papalism. Um, so and, and so the, the number of Catholics in the 1970s who said, no, we want to hold on to our liturgical traditions was much smaller than the number of lay Catholics and religious and clergy today who love the liturgical tradition of the church. And people now are smarter. And we've seen what 50 years of liturgical abuse and confusion have caused. And, and we also know more. We have so many more books, we have videos, we have you know, instructional materials galore that have informed us about the kind of agenda that somebody like Annabali Benini had, right? So you, know, you, you look at all these things and you realize, no, the, the traditional movement is intelligent, it's strong, it's committed, it's zealous. Um, it takes the faith seriously, and in a Western world where the church is going to keep plunging, demographically speaking, the traditional movement will become proportionally stronger. So I, I'm quite confident about that, and I think that what Pope Francis has done with Traditions Custodes is doomed to fail, and it's, it's doomed, it's destined to be replaced by wiser and more charitable legislation.